today we're exploring potentially my favorite national park, White Sands. This park is near and dear to my heart because I spent a lot of time here growing up and I had a lot of fun sliding down these hills and burying my cousins in the sand and occasionally being buried in the sand. <laughs> but this park is more than just a great place for family fun. It also has a really incredible geological story. At first glance, it looks like a winter wonderland, but in reality, it's quite hot here. It's January right now and it's pretty warm, but in the summer, you'll be burning up if you come here, so make sure and bring lots of water if you come here. But these brilliant white dunes hold the story of millions of years of Earth's history, from ancient seas to modern Mars analogs. In this video, I'll go through how these unique sands came to be, what makes them so special, and why researchers are still so fascinated by them today. To start, we'll travel back to over 280 million years ago. At this time, this area was actually submerged underneath a shallow inland sea. And this sea was teeming with marine life, from sponges to corals to ammonites to snails to sea urchins to fish and more. But during this time in the late Permian, something else was going on. The formation of the supercontinent Pangaea. I've talked on this channel before about how this supercontinent, in addition to the volcanism and the Siberian traps, contributed to the Great Dying, the largest mass extinction of the last 550 million years. But how exactly did the supercontinent contribute to extinctions? Well, the smashing together of all the continents led to higher elevation of land and a regression of shallow seas that had covered parts of the continents. In other words, sea level fell and shallow seas that had hosted all sorts of marine life disappeared, including the sea that had been in this region. In addition to sea level fall, Pangaea also caused large scale drying, drying up of the continent because the landmass that made up Pangaea was so large and so much land was far away from an ocean margin that the land became really dry and arid. So the sea that covered this area disappeared due to regression and evaporation. And evaporation causes deposition of evaporites, which are minerals like salts that are left behind when salty water evaporates. And the main evaporite mineral to form in this region when the sea disappeared was gypsum, a calcium sulfate mineral that makes up the sand today. That's what makes this sand so unique. It's not your regular quartz sand, which is the typical common sand, it's gypsum sand. That's why it's so brilliant and white. I actually have a whole video on a whole bunch of different types of sand. If you want to check it out, I'll link it down below. But hold on, the story doesn't end there. Now we know how the region became rich in evaporite minerals like gypsum, but how exactly did these vast dunes form? How long have the dunes themselves been here? And why is it pretty much just gypsum? Why not other evaporite minerals or salts? For this, we have to fast forward to the Oligocene Epoch, around 30 million years ago. At this time, tectonic activity associated with the formation of the Rockies and the basin and range topography of Western North America created the modern Tularosa Basin. This basin is unique in that it's a natural closed system. It doesn't have any major river or drainage outlets. This is important because it means that the only outlet for any river or rain input into the basin is through evaporation. And evaporation creates evaporite minerals like gypsum. Today, the lowest point in Tularosa Basin is Lake Lucero. Unfortunately, we're not in Lake Lucero right now. That's actually further away from the actual dune field. And you can only access it through guided tour once a month, which we didn't come that time of month, so. Oh well, but take my word for it, I'll put some imagery in. Lake Lucero is at the lowest point of Tularosa Basin currently. So because of that, it collects water and due to the desert heat, that water evaporates, leaving behind gypsum deposits. And this happens over and over again. Every time it rains or there's any river input, whatever water goes into that basin and into Lake Lucero will evaporate, forming more and more gypsum. And this is called a playa lake, a temporary body of water that fills up after rain, but then dries up quickly in the desert sun. So Lake Lucero explains the formation of gypsum in the area, but not necessarily the dunes. So 
how did these incredible dune fields form? The dunes themselves are relatively young, forming since the last glacial maximum around 10,000 years ago, which might sound like a long time ago, but remember, whenever I say the word thousands of years ago instead of millions, that's really young on geologic time. So essentially, as the climate warmed, winds picked up gypsum from the Tularosa Basin floor and transported it to this dune field. Well, eventually created this dune field, and it continued to do so, and actually still does today, from Lake Lucero. Those gypsum deposits that are forming Lake Lucero still to this day continually get dried up and then transported by wind to keep building upon these dunes. And fun fact, before the dunes formed here, this region was actually a lush grassland that was home to Ice Age megafauna. And tracks from these animals have been found preserved in the gypsum mud here. So now we have a good idea of the geologic history of the region, even some about the biological history of the region. But now let's get back to the question of why is this all gypsum? Why not any other evaporite minerals like calcite, sylvite, or even halite, table salt? It comes down to a mixture of the chemical, geological, and physical processes that formed these dunes. The ancient shallow sea that covered this region during the Permian around 280 million years ago was rich in ions like calcium and sulfate from the erosion of surrounding rocks, which favors the deposition of evaporites like gypsum over other salts. Also, salts like halite are more soluble than gypsum, meaning that it would take higher concentrations for those to form from the evaporating water. And gypsum is relatively soft, a most hardness of two, and brittle, making it easier to break into fine grains by physical weathering, which allows gypsum deposits formed in Lake Lucero to be broken down into sand-sized grains. These gypsum grains are also perfectly light enough to be transported by wind, but also heavy enough to settle and accumulate to form dunes. Whereas other salts like halite might not break down as efficiently or might dissolve more readily when exposed to moisture in the atmosphere. So in other words, it was the perfect storm of conditions that led to these incredible white gypsum dunes. And lastly, one of my favorite things about white sands is that it's often used as a Mars analog for research into what kind of life could survive such dry conditions. The conditions here are extreme in more ways than one, including intense sun, arid conditions, and high salinity which mimics some environments on Mars. Scientists study microbes surviving in the gypsum sand to better understand what kind of life could live on Mars. But it's not just microbes that live here. There's also incredible bleached lizards that showcase the evolution of camouflage. We haven't found any this time of year. I find more in the summer, so I'll try and find some clips of some, but if not, I'll put some images from elsewhere. So if you ever do come and visit White Sands, remember that it's a place where geology, chemistry, climate, biology, and even planetary science come together. And also remember that what you're standing on has a story that dates back over 250 million years. So anyway, I hope you'll come and visit and see it for yourself. As with all the parks I've visited so far, the camera just doesn't do it justice. But with that, guys, thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye. This moment was me coming to the realization that our trip was over and starting to get a little sad. But the good news is I have another trip coming up this March to Death Valley. I'm so excited for that. And that's actually going to be a collaboration with some other really popular geoscience communicators, including the Groovy Geologist and Seismo Cam. So be sure to keep an eye out for those and also check out Groovy Geologist and Seismo Cam on Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube. And also in the comments, guys, let me know where else you want me to check out.